You're listening to the first ever Canvas Brewery Podcast. Last weekend, we hosted the inaugural Canvas Farmhouse Beer Festival at the brewery in North Tipperary. We had a great selection of Canvas beers, as well as beers from Haney Brewery, Boundary, 12 Acres, and our special guests, Bally Kilcavan. There was great food, walks, talks, tours of the brewery, poetry readings, and live music. Thanks to everyone who came along, and especially those who donated to the Ethiopia Debt Project. We joined Joe and David from Bally Kilgavin and our own Moss and Mark in the Bower Room now to talk all things farmhouse beer and farmhouse brewing in the first ever Canvas Farmhouse Beer Festival live podcast. Dave, to you, what's, what's farmhouse beer to you? Yeah, I mean, farmhouse beer, I think the local ingredients thing for me is, is very important. I came from a background of barley growing. I'm a, a tillage farmer up in County Leash. And for me, one of the reasons I started the brewery was we were growing a lot of malting barley. It was all disappearing off to the maltsters. We never really knew what was happening to it. It ended up in, in a, a large brand stout. And you'd kind of go into the pub and you could tell people visiting, OK, well, this is probably our barley. But you had no idea, really, what was happening to it. We spent probably up to two years getting barley ready to be malted. Uh, by the time you put in the previous year's crop, put in a cover crop, put in the barley. And it's a lot of effort, it's a lot of time, and some years it's a lot of luck. It, it's been a dodgy year this year for barley. So um, I, having put all that effort into growing the barley, I really wanted to be able to taste it. I wanted to brew beers that I knew every element of multi flavor that was in those beers was because of the work that we'd put in growing the barley. Yeah. Um, so for me, it was all about growing barley, growing locally, and, and using what we had on the farm. Um, we're one of the best countries for producing malting barley in the world. The climate, okay, and again, this year nearly is the exception that proves the rule. Yeah. This year, the barley quality in Ireland has been dodgy because it's been so warm, because of the snow at the start of the year. But in general, we get mild winters. We can get the barley in early. It can mature slowly. It's not under stress. We get it out uh, as late as possible because we get uh, cool summers. And it's had as much time to develop flavors and, and to just do everything it needs to do to be really good to brew with. Yeah. So I think we should be promoting Irish barley, uh, promoting Irish ingredients, and doing as much of that as possible. Morris, um, that reminds me of the, I was gonna, I'm gonna bounce back. No, because it reminded me of how you got into brewing, Morris, and you're sitting in the tractor where you tell that story. Um, yeah, so how I got into brewing was a, a similar, uh, similar thing, because we're farmers here, and we'd always been growing malty barley, and we, we stopped, well, they stopped collecting malty barley in this area, so we, we didn't have a choice in the matter, basically. Um, and that was a sore point that it, it stopped. We had to change our production system because of it, and it wasn't as big an earner producing feed barley. Um, and it was, yeah, for me, the funny, the funny bit of starting to brew was, I can remember the moment that we, uh, I was just, we were I think I was baling straw, and you know, I was looking out the back and listening to the radio, because long old day, and the metal man were on, they were talking about the RDS Craft Beer Fair. And uh, they just were chatting away about making beer and all of this. And I kind of, you know, checked the machine over the shoulder, listening to beer, and it was kind of checked the beer, checked the baler. Hold on a second, we used to grow molding barley. And they're talking about making beer, and making beer sounds fun. And it's like, why on earth don't we, like, stop being at the mercy of the big multiples? Why don't we take control of this and actually make the beer ourselves? Um, just five or six years later, we actually have opened a brewery and, and don't know of that. But so, yeah, so for me, the beer starts with the barley and growing it. And it's like there's so many elements in growing barley that you look after and then you just wave goodbye to it and it dries out the gate. Um, so making that into something that can actually be in a bottle that people, neighbours can actually buy, that's that's a huge factor for me. Um, and that And that's... That's definitely what typifies a, f a farm brewery. You know what I mean? That that you're producing the ingredients and doing and and finishing something. So we're kind of we're kind of we're breaking down then the difference between farm brewery and farmhouse brewery. So Joe, do you want like you know about from the beer styles as well? What's your opinion? Well, obviously be before I started with with David and the guys um, from a a brew perspective or a brewer's perspective, it would be a farmhouse a style. So your saisons and and brew. Um, it says on, so it's a uh, it's a, a French style that was brewed for uh, an old style beer that was brewed for workers on the farms by the by the farmers, um, kind of spicy, um, a little bit of kind of funk sometimes in them as well. They put their they're a a, a low ABV and they were designed 
to keep the farm workers happy during harvest time. So summer beer, um, lots of peppery, nice flavours in them, and they're quite different than what we get. The f nice dry finish as well, and um, they so for me saying if a farm a farmhouse beer would be um, open fermentations beers grown on farms for farmers, um, but now it's going to evolve because beer does, um, and me working with the guys, um, I've. If you ask me now, I'd probably say it's uh, um, pretty similar to what the guy said. It's it's produced um, as much as possible on the farm, and what if we can touch it on the farm, then we should be able to try and put it into our beer. Um, and yeah, and you shouldn't have to, you know, go miles to 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 make pr produce. And uh, as well as that, you you see what I have struggled to find is you go to a restaurant and. The restaurant there is shouting about everything. You go and look at all our meat is sourced from whatever butcher. The um, you know the fish is from here. Um, this is from here, and then you go look at the the beer section. Mm. Why can't it just come down to, to and it's, it's, there's no locally produced beer on the menu? The wines from well, like I know obviously you can, we can't grow wine, but you know um, we should be drinking what we produce, and it's it's um, for for. For me, it's very important to support local and, and to use what we have, and and it's been really highlighted since I since I started working with, with David and, and the even the uh, you br you guys probably know as well if you're using your own barley, you do get a very distinct flavour in your beer, because when you when you're getting buying barley in from a malster, the barley's mixed. It's it's from several different areas, so you're getting you're getting different protein levels. You're getting different types of um, barley coming in. When you get it here, you have one single origin barley, which is, you know, you should be shouting about that. You know, it's a single origin. And, and um, like, we can, I think we, we may have to, like, park the styles and then have a, say, like, because the BJCP can get very, very, yeah. <laughs> and we'll kind of maybe focus it, we can, we'll make farmhouse ales in farmhouse. Yeah. So Sorry. It's WhatsApp. Um, yeah, <laughs> class. And, like, so that's, like, we're we're mad into beer and we're bamboozled by it's this whole thing of labels and what's this and what's that and it's like this i believe we're in a renaissance of beer and it's just and it's a rebirth you know and it's it's rediscovering and then you've got different places breaking up different rules um so going on from that so that we haven't really drawn a line of what we we see farm we feel that farmhouses it's of terroir it's of the area some people might take our heads off for that but in essence, we're trying to come up with something maybe that's something dry in the summer for a farmer when he's on the harvest there in September, in August, September, and he's uh, he's gasping, but he doesn't, he can't drink five or six beers. He wants one dry one. Um, so then, from from farm beers, what do you feel is what do we need to support? Like we're so again, we're 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 we're, we're the small kids and we're the new kids in the block. And we're, we, one of the reasons we kind of created this is that we wanted to have a discussion about um, between ourselves and Heaney Brewery and um, 12 Acres, who might give me a few more, Brehan, Meskin, uh, there's about Western, Western, Western Herd, there's about seven or eight, Kinnegar, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and so there's a question is, what? <laughs> <laughs> What do you think is the opportunity? Why, uh, why should Irish drinkers uh, listening to this uh, be supporting Irish farmhouse beers? What, what makes us? What could? What can we add to the economy? And what can what can farmhouse breweries do? Okay, again, for me, and, and this is very personal and kind of on my own situation. It's it's the differentiation, I suppose, between us and I suppose in, in a way everyone else. Um, I would like to see as many people coming onto the farm as possible because I people want. To people to see the barley being grown, I want to see people, the hops being grown, uh, and then the way we produce it. Um, at the minute, we're, we're bottle conditioning everything, we're trying to keep everything as natural as possible, as traditional as possible. Um, and I just, I'd like to get tourists in, I'd like to get locals in, I'd like to get everyone who wants to come and visit the farm to, to see that and to see the brewing process. Um, we're lucky, I mean, this is an absolutely fantastic setting down here. Um, and I think we're all lucky in that we can do that. We can get people in. Um, if you want to just come and have a look around the farm, you can come and have a look around the farm. And people 
I find react really positively to that. Um, so I would love to see trails set up. I'd love to see a network of farm farmhouse beers and breweries in the country that uh, you know there's a there's a central leaflet that you'd go to any one of us and we'll all have the leaflet there that you can see the other places mm -hmm. um, and to me that would be one way of getting our name out there as something a little bit different from the rest of the market. Yeah. One of the best lines I heard about small breweries uh, was on a video a few years ago and he's like you know we are inefficient mm -hmm. you know we Budweiser, Diageo they can make x amount of liters with one guy pushing a bunch of buttons we are inefficient and as a result, we create more jobs and we keep more things in locally. And there's actually a huge bonus on that. And that, you know, you kind of get that connection through. Um, I'm going to do one little pause. We've got also brilliantly timed with the rain. <laughs> <laughs> um, hands up. We've got food coming up as well uh, after this talk. So we've got burritos. We've pulled pork burritos and we've got Cuban. Uh, I can't remember the middle word. Cuban, Cuban something or other. Picadillo. Cuban picadillo. Uh, uh, burritos and vegetarian burritos. Let's show a hands anyone who wants a burrito. Deadly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, hands up who's leaning towards the pulled pork. That's twigs pigs, by the way. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and the Cuban picadillo. I have no idea what it is. And it's got like it's got like uh, it's got pineapple jerk, uh, lime juice. I have a bunch of funky different things. And vegetarian. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there was, they're not going to put their hand up anyway. Like, um, so yeah, 50-50. Uh, that's perfect. Um, any questions, guys? Yep. It sounds like you, you're veered towards um, got the, the mainstream beers and craft against that. But now you're going down a level that almost suggests and creating categories within craft to distinguish kind of obviously farmhouse breweries and style from something else. Is that kind of what you're looking to, what to do, or is that a kind of good concept? I'm not really trying to split up to say, oh, we're, we're a farmhouse brewery, so obviously we're better than any other type of craft brewery. It's just, for me, it's, it's our differentiation. It's uh, maybe you want to go and see bigger breweries. Maybe you want to come and see farmhouse breweries. We are the farmhouse breweries. If you want to see a farmhouse brewery, here are the six or seven in the country that you want to come and see. Um, it's, it's one of the big things. I mean, anytime I go in front of a, a, a panel of, of whatever judges in, in any competition, they say, why are you different to all the other 99 breweries that are out there? And for me, it's a case of we're in a very small subset of people who are based on farms, who are sourcing our ingredients locally, we're trying to get the whole system from the very ground up uh, and brewing with what we can produce ourselves. And as I say, any time that I get people onto the farm, they react hugely positively to that. Uh, and I think that's something we need to promote. Yeah. For, for me, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a teacher as well. And I teach in Dublin. And, you know, the kids see a Frisian cow, and they go, holy shit, look, it's a cow, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so... I, I get a huge buzz out of getting kids to eat food and understand food and understand... Uh, I haven't pushed them on the alcohol just yet, <laughs> but the, the concept of... Like, what I know Morris and, and, his, and, and, his, and his father and family are just really passionate about what they do, and your dad said once, it's, like it's, it's a way of life, you know, it's... You know, and I, I think it's probably the same for brewing. You know, it's a, people think, oh, you got a brewery, you're loaded. It's like, no, <laughs> yeah, not at all. It's a manufacturing business. But I get a huge kick for me. I get a huge kick about people seeing this is what the country is. This is how beer is made. This is more, this is where you're coming from because if we don't look after those things, if we have cities not thinking about understanding what's happening in the country, we are going to have people not understanding what, how farmers are going to be under wicked pressure next year with the fodder crisis and things like that. And when people don't have that understanding, they don't pay any sympathy to those farmers and farmers are at their wits end. And we, like, we know it and it's, it's really upsetting and when it's gone, it's going to be gone. Yeah, and uh, I mean, a big thing for me is the, the disconnect people have between production and consumption, so that, say the fodder crisis, it's like, oh, fodder, it's like, oh, would you not just buy more? And it's like, well, there's only so much grass growing every year. There's only so much barley growing every year. There is a finite amount in the world. And if you look at the world as a whole, there is a finite amount of resources. There's a finite amount of oil out there. Um, so by connecting people to farmhouse brewing, by connecting people back to the land and saying like, look, this is what we produce from this farm and that's all that we do. We use what's available. That 
you're reconnecting with this idea of limited supply because for so many years the green revolution has pushed and i mean you can say that the food mountains have pushed this idea that there is just another thing of butter there to buy in the supermarket but but that production who made that who that's that took 12 months. I mean, you have to have a herd of cattle to produce milk to then produce all of these other things. So it's just to connect people back to that idea. And the thing I talk about is the idea of the strawberry in a supermarket. You go into a strawberry and into a supermarket, going into a strawberry would be difficult. <laughs> you go into a supermarket in January and February and you buy strawberries, they look like a strawberry and, and sort of smells like one. You taste it and it's like, it doesn't taste proper. Like, what's what happened? It's like, it's the wrong month, man. Like, it, it's... It's the end of the growing season. That's when you have strawberries. That's when they're in season. That's when they taste properly. And I, I do it with apples. You buy an apple and it, like, it looks brilliant. Like, and then you bite into it and you get this disappointing. You're like, oh, but apples aren't in season. Like, why did I buy an apple? That's, it's available, but it doesn't taste the same way. And farmhouse brewing is that idea of connecting people back to production and, and, and connecting people back to the environment. Because for me, brewing and farming starts with the soil and builds all the way up. Yeah, um, so just like in terms of scalability then, so obviously like uh, both breweries are then in, in, in it to kind of like get people to drink their beer and kind of expand them beyond that. What's the scalability, like how important is it for you guys and what's like, so the upper limits of your scalability is then you're in producing as much as you can. Do you expand your farm or what do you do then? Have you kind of factored it in? Uh, like it's obviously, it's, it's probably a goal or at least a, a, a goal, objective goal to aim toward at least, and have you kind of like factored in what's the next step when you get to that, if you're talking about sustainability long term um, from the ground ground up like? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, when I started investigating it, I was the, one of the most disappointing things I found out was how much beer you can brew from very, very small amounts of barley. Uh, we don't actually have to produce big quantities of barley to be able to, we're certainly gonna run out of fermentation space before we run out of barley. Um, there's absolutely no, we could, we used to grow about 500 tons of barley a year. Um, I can't do the maths in my head, but if you multiply that by 10,000, that's the amount of pints you will get out of that yeah. amount of barley. So there's no problem in terms of producing the barley. Um, we are in similar enough buildings to this. They're old stone buildings. Um, if they could have just built them about a meter wider 230 years ago, that would have been fantastic. Um, <laughs> but we will we will run out of fermentation space and that's and but i mean that's relatively easy to fix you know you just buy more fermenters and stick them somewhere else and put a pipe over to them so uh in terms of ingredient production no i mean scalability is, isn't an issue and the farmhouse labels of yourselves which is a both kind of both at the moment is that kind of an important threshold a niche market or is it just kind of just like well it is what we are at the moment and we're kind of like growing and once we have the Yeah, I mean, uh, that is, we joked about one person who, one, another brewery that's kind of moving out of their farmhouse into a more industrial setting. Um, and for me, like, I, I just wouldn't be that interested in doing that, if you know what I mean. Because yeah. um, kind of the old question, or the old thing as farmers, basically, when we were negotiating with that large product producer or consumer of malting barley, the big thing was that it was a penny in the pint was what the malting barley was. Um, you know what I mean? It's, it's such a tiny amount and they would drive the price down to just the cost that it would take the farmers to do it. Um, so for me, like scaling up, I would love to scale up and buy other farmers malt because then, well then that's malt just traveling half a mile down the road. I mean, that would be wonderful. I mean, the amount of pints you'd have to produce will be a long time getting there, but that I, I think that idea is that things should be coming locally and we shouldn't be transporting stuff all large distances. And then, so yeah, that's, I would love to do that. But for me, the, the tag of farmhouse beer, farmhouse brewing, it's, it is important because it's everything that we do as farmers and, and connecting down to brewing you're thinking about what you do with your barley and how it's produced. So not coming from the other angle is essentially you just buy ingredients and you've, you've no connection to what it is and no understanding of it. So yeah, I, I, I think it would be important and I, I don't think I'd be looking to kind of scale past it.
Um, just to add to that, I mean, in terms of what we're trying to do at Ballycock Cavan, it's, it's a twofold thing in a way. Um, the farm's been in the family for a long time. I wanted to do something that would diversify it because tillage farming is under pressure. Um, so I wanted to put in something that, that if uh, we have three kids at home, if they want to take over, and I have no idea if they do, uh, then they have another option to do that. We also have a set of old buildings at home that I was looking for a use for. And this works perfectly. It, it's a I think, hopefully, you come up and visit us at some stage. I think we're, we're doing a nice job in converting these old buildings, and we have a heap more old buildings to do up. And in a way, it's a great excuse to do something with them. Um, you know, the, the sensible option, in a way, is to find an industrial unit in Port Leash and stick it all in there. Yeah. But that takes away from me as to what we're trying to do. We're trying to grow the stuff on site, we're trying to brew the stuff on site, and that's what I want to do. And hopefully, we expand and we have plenty of space that we can do it at home. We'll do it there. And now be able to sell it on site is the I next thing, yeah, you know, yeah, that's yeah. really, and it's that primary, primary economic activity of farming, secondary, manufacturing, and then tertiary, bringing people in, it's, it's really exciting. Question? All right, sweet. Uh, yep. Uh, as barley producers, uh, do you have any, um, any dreams of maybe looking towards whiskey? And um, also, if you have any ideas of whiskey, would you be interested in, in Irish peat smoked whiskey? Because, you know, uh, for whatever reason, you have uh, peat smoked uh, scotch whiskey, but it doesn't appear to be a thing in Ireland at all. Yeah. Whiskey, lads? Um, okay, again, when I was looking at options for the farm, this is five or six years ago at this stage, I looked at beer and I looked at whiskey, and I drink both, and I'm very happy drinking both. Uh, it was going to cost me about four million, I think, to set up a whiskey distillery. And uh, I'm afraid I only, you know, I only had 3.6 million, so I couldn't quite, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't quite manage to get up to there. By the time, um, the real problem is, okay, so you can do gin and, and vodka, which is a lot of people are doing to get cash flow. Uh, but if you're doing just whiskey, it's minimum three years, preferably five years, ideally seven years before you actually get any cash flow back out of it. Barrels have gone scarce and, and are expensive. Uh, the kit is expensive. I've been homebrewing for a long time, so I knew what I was doing, roughly speaking, in, in terms of brewing. I, I know nothing about distilling, really. Um, I'd, I would, you know, I, I, I'd still have dreams of when my wife wins the lottery, putting in a whiskey distillery as well, but the expense of it, um, and it, it's, it's again, got to the same stage. Craft beer is obviously fairly saturated. Irish craft whiskey is fairly saturated as well. Um, yeah, I, I like I like peated whiskies. I have to say, like Connemara, obviously do a, a, a peated um, whiskey, um, but I I am a fan of of sort of the Isle of whiskies in Scotland. Now they get too much um, kind of like hops in beer. You can go too far with it, I think. Um, but it's sort of a lightly peated whiskey. I'm I'm a big fan of. So um, yeah, as I say, when my wife wins the lottery, which she doesn't enter, um, then we'll, <laughs> we'll think about putting in a whiskey distillery. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not a huge fan of peated whiskies, so not no to pe peated whiskies. Um, yeah, it's just the whiskey is such a long-term thing. So we've we've developed this brewery basically on a shoestring and kind of ourselves and then some like founding members who kind of helped us out to kit out the building and stuff. So for us, yeah, it was that we could do it on a small scale and uh, farm level it is kind of on a small scale. Like we wouldn't have the couple of million in the back pocket to sink into something. Um, so yeah, that's... It's interesting, but yeah. Because I think it was a, a, another side of it as well is that if you're any good at producing whiskey, and by the time your whiskey is actually on the shelf to be bought, you generally are bought out by someone else because th the big boys come in and go, hang on, you're good. <laughs> so they buy you out. So a lot, a lot of the craft whiskeys that have come out, have by the even time they've even produced or had gotten to sale, the words got around the uh, the big boys that they're good and they get bought out. So um, it's sorry. Can they, can they not just go no? We're well, not you we're suppose you can, but then if someone, if you're after investing a, an absolute massive wad of, and then you're still waiting to see any return, and then some multinational comes in and goes, here's a, a bigger wad. here's a bigger <laughs> wad of money, and we'll still call and we'll still say you're independent, or we'll just kind of give you some guidance, and then they go right, no problem, we'll take that, and then might set up their own, another one, or another brewery. But it, it is an issue in brewing as well, though, that, that as, as craft breweries do well and get bigger, that the big, the big producers get worried that their, their sales are reducing and these craft beers are increasing. Because um, I, I, I think it's, it's, around, it's around the country and it's around the globe. People are beginning to turn away from this idea of mass production and towards local production. And to combat that, the large producers 
seeing dwindling sales have to fight it. And what they do have is large wads of cash. So they can offer it to people who've been struggling for years producing, being very successful, but are possibly struggling in terms of their balance sheet and stuff. And they say, here's a big wad of cash. You just keep your face in the front of it and uh, we'll just take, do all the rest of it. Um, so it hasn't really happened in Ireland yet. I don't like well, touching it on eight degrees, but I, I think that will come down the line in terms of beer. Um. That's it. Well, look, um, cheers, lads. And uh, just yep. back to the farmer's point of view of the barley, <coughs> it, it's... Uh, the high protein barley is not wanted in this situation, isn't that right? So I just wonder, how do you kind of calculate the protein in the barley? Is there a small brewing, a small malting process done to calculate the amount of protein in, in a sample of barley? The, um, anytime we drive a trailer into the malt house, they stick a big probe in it and they stick it into a machine and about 25 seconds later it'll tell you what the protein level is in it. Uh, it's a, it and it's a very expensive piece of kit because I'd love to have it on farm uh, to be able to test my own protein levels before I send it into them. Um, in, if you were, the way the brewing scene actually is working at the minute in terms of, of big beers, big beer sales are declining and whiskey sales are increasing. So actually the maltsters are looking for lower protein barleys to go into distilleries. Uh, because distilleries want as low as possible. They really don't want any protein in it because they want as much carbohydrate to turn into alcohol. Um, but in a year like this, we've struggled to get anything close to brewing spec. We just about have enough to keep ourselves brewing. Um, but everything is very high protein up in our level. I hear down in Cork, it's not so bad, but there's going to be a severe global shortage of good quality brewing barley and an absolute global shortage of good quality distilling barley mainly because in this part of the world because of the snow meaning later sowing so it has less time to use up the nitrogen in the soil which is what causes the protein and then because of the drought it didn't suck up enough moisture to create carbohydrate to dilute down the protein levels is there is yeah i mean you will get um you don't want too much protein if you get if you don't have enough protein in it you have head retention problems i'm going to pass this over to the brewers actually to be honest but if you have too much you'll get this you'll get this chill haze in it as well uh which is not uh which is not ideal so part of the brewing process is you boil it and then you cool it down and that removes some of the protein it, it basically puts it into lumps and then that falls out and, and you can take that out uh but yeah i it's funny because when i was just a farmer you know, you'd produce 13% malting barley and the malsters would reject it. It's like, what the hell are you rejecting? It's perfectly good barley. It's lovely. Uh, but now when you come into it from the brewing side of things, you see why they do reject high-protein barley because particularly bigger breweries don't want to have to deal with it. They can deal with it, um, but the ways they deal with it are probably not as... Um, I'll be very careful here. They, uh, <laughs> they, 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 yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they will put things into, you know, they will... They will filter it out, or they will put finings in, or they will put enzymes in, or something like that to, to deal with it. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not the way that I want to produce beer. Yeah, that was the story when I went to grow barley years ago. Was the protein calculation was determined the price of it. And mm -hmm. uh, moisture, of course, they were the two ones. The real danger is. It's, uh, listen, growing malt and barley is tricky because growing feed barley is just so easy. Just put it in the ground, you grow it, and it gets taken away. And regardless, okay, apart from the fungus, they, they wouldn't be too keen on that. But anything else that's, that's wrong with it as such, they'll take it. Malting barley has to be within spec, and the spec is tightening all the time. And the spec is generally dictated by James's Gate because James's Gate tell the maltsters what they want, and the maltsters tell us as farmers what, they, what we have to produce. Down the price. That's, yeah, I mean, uh, the price is kind of dependent, independent of that. Uh, the price will be a global price, effectively. Um, but it's, it's what the brewers want. And if they can get enough of stuff that's in good spec, they'll take that. In a year like this, I don't know where they're going to get it. Um, I presume they're going to have to import barley because we don't have enough within spec um, that they're going to be able to use in this country. Go back on this year. What, what is happening this year? Is it too high or too low? Far too high. Far too high. We got, as I say, we got, we'd normally sow in the middle of March. We got sown on the 14th of April this year because of the snow. So that means it has a month less to grow. It has a month less to get its roots down, which means then when we got the drought, it didn't have enough of a root structure to pull up whatever moisture was there. Then it ran out of moisture in the soil. And 
if it gets a lot of rain, sort of May, June, that's usually good for it because it'll pull up the moisture, it'll be able to form lots of carbohydrate, you get big fat grains full of carbohydrate, and that dilutes the protein level down. So the protein is how much nitrogen it's pulled up into the head uh, of the barley, and then if you can get more carbohydrate in, it dilutes that down. So the percentage of protein gets reduced. When you don't have any rain in May and June, there's no moisture coming up, it still picks up the nitrogen, so you've got very high protein barley. And actually what happened this year was, even after the drought, there was a little bit of rain, and that activated some of the nitrogen in the soil. There was nothing left of the plant, so it went straight up into the head, and that's why we're all at 12, 12.5% proteins, um, which is not, it's certainly not good for distilling, and it's not brilliant for brewing with. Sorry? Ideal, well, the spec is between 9.3 and 11.6. Uh, sorry, 11.8. It, it used to be 12.6, and one year, about a month after it was planted, a directive came down to the maltsters to say, bring it down to 11.8. So that is like 3 or 4 point three make a big difference? Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, you think the difference between 11.8 and, say, 12.5, 13 is not a lot, but actually it is. Um, they, ideally, what we, we're lucky in that we are going to be brewing next year with last year's malt, which was brilliant. It was just a really good year. It grew really well. It was high yield, and high yield always means that there's more grains of barley. You put out the same amount of nitrogen, um, but it's high yield, so it di gets diluted down between all the di between all the more grains that you've got. So we, I think we were about 10.2 percent last year. Um, what you don't want is a year where you've got low yields because, again, we're trying to predict. We put the fertilizer out in April, and then we're trying to predict what the weather will do in June, and that's kind of tricky. So um, you, you have to assume it's going to be a normal year. You put out the recommended amount of fertilizer, you then get a drought, and that's when you get into trouble. Um, well, m uh, modern breweries will have complete control over the, the water so that you can profile your water. And um, you use a, an RO system. So like a, like a, if you can think about it at home, if you want to filter out your, your, um, your chlorine and, and whatever else is like under the sink, we have big scales of those so that we can basically, um, a, if we want to do a stout, which is a different water profile than than a, than a pale ale or a lager, we can change the profile using different you know different chemicals um, that are naturally occurring. So that we're not actually minerals, had minerals yeah, minerals. <laughs> so, salts, <laughs> salts is the word. <laughs> salts, um, and then um, so like that's why if you look at um, different regions in the world, they produce different beers, and that's down to the water, because obviously water is the, the main ingredient. Um, so you, you'll see in in Germany and Czech Republic, their water profile is is uh, is suited to to lagers and and um, pilsners. And then here we've the we've very like in Dublin and in um, in London, there's a very limey water, so that's more suited to, to your stouts and, and things like that. So that's where you get now nowadays. You're not just based on regionalization of your of your water. You you can just uh, fix it. Um, yeah, I mean, there is there's an interesting. There's a brewery in San Francisco where they have, they've got four different reservoirs feeding the brewery. So every day they have to check the water to see when, from which reservoir it's coming, and adjust the water accordingly. Um, so certainly, uh, being on a farm, out we've our own spring, so that's our water. It doesn't change every day. It's it's pretty consistent. Um, so yeah, we haven't gone the the RO or the reverse osmosis route. So we just use the water we have. Um, Sometimes try and change it a little bit, but it's essentially it's very hard water. And um, so that does mean that when we're lead it, we do tend towards the stouts and the darker beers because that's what naturally it would do. Um, but certainly, yeah, water is a huge part of it and water quality is a big part of brewing. I mean, so that's your water is your main ingredient, essentially, and then your, your malt and your hops and your yeast then define a lot of the flavours. Um, but yeah, certainly having having our own water supply is an advantage because at least it's consistent. We know what it's what it's doing, and then we also have to deal with our own wastewater as well, which is another part of the whole looking after everything in a cycle. Is when you're in an industrial estate, you ask people what do you what what do you do with your water, and they're like, oh, goes down, down the down drain. <laughs> like that's that's what it does, and you know, we have to pay for it. It's annoying, but you, they've no idea what happens to it. Whereas when you're on your own farm, you have to deal with your own water. You're like. 
well, okay, now let's, uh, okay, can we separate the yeast out? What can we do to look after the water? Because um, all that water then, ultimately that water goes back on the land somewhere. Um, I mean, when it goes down the pipe in Ireland, we maybe n are not amazing. A lot of it goes into rivers and sometimes treated, sometimes not. And it's something that we are improving on in the country as a whole. I mean, water quality is in general an upward trend, but it wasn't very good at the beginning. Um, and again, it's, it's partially like what happens to what we use. Once you flush it down the toilet, it's like, oh, it's gone. It's like, well, no, it, it goes somewhere. You have to treat it. And then even still after treating it, it probably goes out into the sea. And then what happens then? Is there nutrients in it? Is there something useful that could have been there? So uh, partially it's another that difference of farmhouse brewing of you have to look after all of those elements. Um, which is when we get to pay rates, it's like, well, hold on a second, we're dealing with everything, lads, we're not getting any benefits of it. Um, but that's part of the challenges of doing it in a farm, right? Great. Right, cheers, guys. I, I think we kind of aimed for about a 20 minute, half an hour, but the rain has stopped and... Just a question going in from Sir Derek Work. Ooh. Yeah, cool. Sorry, say again? Where can you get our beers? Uh, well, our beers are for sale locally. Um, so we've, we're a uh, canvas brewery. We're on such a small scale. And uh, because we're on such a small scale, we want to look after the people around us first. Uh, very often when you're a new brewery, you get popular around the whole country and everyone wants to try the new brewery straight away. And, uh, and they'll all try it once. And then you can get excited and go get a big loan and get loads of new fermenters. And then suddenly... People go, you're not the newbies anymore. So you gotta. We really want to work on our local area. And uh, for me, <coughs> uh, it's a, a brilliant brewer called uh, Coolin from White Gypsy over in Tepper Moor. And uh, he said, you know, he had a dream that one day we'd have hundreds of breweries around Ireland all serving their own local area. So for us at the moment, we're, we're we want to we're selling locally. And uh, as we if we come up with some specials and people demand it, we're going to push it out a little bit further than that. And you guys. Yeah, we're very kind of very much local as well to start with. Um, we're just starting to expand out a little bit more. So anywhere we're obviously based tribally kind of Leash. So anywhere in around Leash, Kildare, uh, then uh, O'Donovan's in Cork, uh, Malloy's up in Dublin, a couple of Super Valleys up in Dublin as well, Knock Lyon, Luke and Blanchardstown, uh, and then Gibneys and I'm going to forget one. Um, Fairview Martins, Fairview as well. Um, yeah, that was mad. I can't believe we're here on the farm. We got a question from Twitter. <laughs> yeah, Wi-Fi is what's yeah. So this this has been one of Mark's thing. Is like, you know, is there any internet in the brewery, Mark? So I'm like, Mark, it's North Tipperary. This is just, just forget that. So a couple of months ago, I did manage to hook up some internet in here. So. Yeah. Not, not quite that. <laughs> I've been painting the walls in our own brewery building for the last two days and it's been heavenly because we've absolutely no mobile phone signal there whatsoever. So like eight hours of constant no one being able to ring me. It's been yeah. brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Pretty hard and I'm on the road. <laughs> <laughs> so look, guys, uh, that was... Um, I, I didn't... I thought we were going to meander our way through and be out here after 15 minutes, but the conversation was, was fascinating and I, I definitely learned a huge amount. So thanks a million. Thanks a million for being a great audience and uh, for our first ever... Uh, live Canvas podcast. Yeah, cheers, guys. <laughs>